my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. I'm your co-host today, Dr. Mike Akinfor, and today I have a special treat for me personally. I have one of my mentors here, Dr. Christopher Kent. Christopher, how are you? Terrific. Thank you. And I just want to read Dr. Kent's short bio. Dr. Kent is a 1973 graduate of Palmer College of Chiropractic and a diplomate and fellow of the ICA College of Chiropractic Imaging. Dr. Kent is the president of the Foundation for Vertebral Subluxation and a member of the Board of Trustees of Sherman College of Chiropractic and the owner of On Purpose LLC. An attorney as well as a chiropractor, Dr. Kent is an active member of the State Bar of California and is admitted as an attorney of the U.S. District Court southern district of california dr kent welcome to the show thank you so you've written a really neat article that i i really want to go through with you called stress distress and the human spirit can you talk to our audience about what your article is about yes uh, one thing i'm very passionate about is the concept that stress is not a universally negative phenomenon you hear people say, if only I could reduce the amount of stress in my life. Some even say, I wish I could eliminate stress from my life. And that's not going to happen until you pass from, from this life because the essence of life is stress and adaptation. Mm. So when we come up with this notion that stress is a negative thing, we really need to look at the process of life and realize that, uh, you know, I, I saw an ad the other day that said uh, the cause of stress revealed. Well, the cause of stress is being alive. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to get rid of that. Um, and if we go back to the writings of Hans Selye, who conceived the idea of stress in the context of biological systems, he, he basically took the engineering idea of stress and adapted it to medicine and biology. Interesting. And um, he came up with some truly amazing stuff. So he publishes this paper in, in the 1930s, right? Right. Back in 1936, uh, his seminal paper was a syndrome produced by diverse noxious agents. And since then, there have been more than 100,000 articles and books written on stress. Uh, he really stumbled onto and developed a concept uh, that's fundamental to understanding the dynamics of the human experience. But unfortunately, people have only looked at half the picture, and the picture that they are looking at is all negative. That stress is bad. It has to be decreased. It has to be managed. It has to be eliminated. It has to be pummeled into submission. And this is really a misunderstanding of what stress means biologically and how stress can really be a part of the nectar of enjoying the human experience. You know, why do people jump out of perfectly good airplanes with parachutes? Um, why do they go to movies that they know that will make them cry? Why do people eat uh, red hot food that burns on the way out as well as the way in? It's because they want to expand the scope of the human experience. Wonderful. So he describes stress as the nonspecific response to any demand. Can you talk about that in his experiments? Yeah, it's really fascinating to hear how he arrived at this concept. Um, when I was teaching at Palmer College, uh, Selye came and spoke to the student body and after that was gracious enough to spend some time with faculty for kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations. And he related a story to us that anyone who has studied to become a doctor of whatever school can relate to. Uh, he was in a class in differential diagnosis. And the idea was to look at the subtle differences in symptoms and clinical presentations so that you could differentiate one disease from another. Mm -hmm. And this was in a, an amphitheater type classroom. And he was sitting in this amphitheater and this parade of sick humanity was 
uh, brought to the center by the professor. And the professor would read the patient's history and describe the diagnostic findings and so forth, and then call on students to say, well, I would do this or that test, or I think these are the diagnostic possibilities, and, and here's how we could differentiate one from another. Mm. And Sellier said, while I was sitting in that classroom watching this parade of sick people, instead of focusing on the subtle differences between one disease and another, I started to realize that there were commonalities. And while I was thinking about this, of course, the professor, as some professors are wont to do, mm -hmm. saw that his mind was wandering and called on me and said, Sally, what's wrong with this patient? And he said, I, I kind of blurted out almost reflexively, well, doctor, he's sick. And everyone laughed and mm -hmm. had a joke at Sally's expense. But it started him on this path where instead of differentiating one disease from another so a more specific treatment could be applied, he looked at, well, what do all of these individuals who are having challenges with their lives have in common? And that led to that concept of a nonspecific response to a challenge. Interesting. So what are those those nonspecific responses, what are the three stages that we're talking about here? Well, the way he came up with this was through experimentation with animals, uh, largely mice. In fact, I, I have a picture of him holding a mouse, which is kind of a classic. And what he did was subject his experimental animals to various demands. Some were physical, uh, extremes in temperature and so forth. Some were chemical, some were psycho-emotional, where they were frustrated by inconsistent rewards and punishments in the Skinner box type arrangement. Mm. And after the animals um, had gone through this, he dissected them, and it was very interesting. He found that regardless of the nature of what he termed the stressor, whether it was physical, chemical, or emotional in nature, the same pathologies, the same diseased tissue findings were evident. And he found that their adrenal glands, which are associated, of course, with fight flight, were pathological. The thymus gland and the lymphatic system were affected, what he called thymico-lymphatic involution. And he also noticed that there was ulceration in the gastrointestinal tract. So they had ulcers, their adrenals were burned sure. out, and their immune systems were shot. Mm -hmm. And the three stages that he identified were the alarm reaction, which is the initial reaction. Um, the body is saying, hey, something is terribly wrong here. Something's different. My world has changed. The second is the stage of adaptation. And that's where all of the biological processes are mustered to respond to that reaction. And this is really key, as we'll see later on, because it's kind of at this point that a determination is made whether there's a threat present or not. Sure. Is this a threat or is this a challenge? And its perception as a threat or a challenge will determine the outcome. And the last stage, of course, is the stage of exhaustion, and that's where the limits of adaptation are exceeded and the animal can no longer appropriately respond. And that's that's fascinating because we, we need to really hit on that again. The demands could be either physical, chemical, or emotional, and not just because people think of stress or, or a demand as more of a – uh, psychological or, or emotional, but it could be physical and chemical as well. I, I suspect in most cases it's a blend of all three. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. So let's talk about the, the good and the bad stress. Let's talk about distress and what most people may have never heard of is eustress. Exactly. Um, Salier noted in his writings that stress is not necessarily bad for you. It's also the spice of life. For any emotion, any activity causes stress. The same stress that makes one person sick is an invigorating experience for another. 
And he also noted that complete absence of stress is incompatible with life since only a dead individual makes no demand on body or mind. So he described two types of stress. And this is so congruent with what we've studied in chiropractic. Um, The first type of stress is what most people refer to when they use the term. And Selye called this distress, D-I-S hyphen stress, from the Latin bad as in dissonance. So distress is negative stress. That's where there is a perception by the organism that there's a threat present. Uh, that is what elicits the classic fight-flight response. Sure. Um, that's what we developed um, when you had to have the ability to run real fast if a saber-toothed tiger was, was breathing down your back. Uh, when you had a threat, you had two options, either get out of there or take on the challenge and, and try to prevail. So we're in a world where that fight-flight response continues to be elicited by everyday activity, whether it's frustration at work, whether it's someone cutting you off on the highway, whether it's um, thinking about your finances, um, whether it's stumbling on the sidewalk. Uh, It can be physical. It can be chemical. It could be emotional. It could be secondhand smoke. It could be drinking diet beverages. It could be all kinds of things usually a panoply of all of these, and when the body sees itself threatened, it kicks into that distress mode. Absolutely, it, yeah. And, and and that's pandemic today. It is uh, pandemic. We see people eliciting that distress, fight-flight response when they have no means of expressing it. They're in their car, someone cuts them off, There's that burst of adrenaline, their face turns red, their muscles tighten, they clench their jaw, and they don't fight or fly, Uh, they're stuck in their car. So that is internalized and creates um, a cascade of negative physiological consequences, uh, such as immunosuppression, uh, such as uh, compromised metabolism, uh, particularly of glucose. Uh, an endocrine cascade that can be very destructive on many levels. And unlike the caveman who had the ability to wrestle a tiger or or run as fast as he could, they're stuck in that car. And when we continue to elicit that response over and over and over, you end up with the manifestations of disease that most people say are, you know, stress-related. They think, well, the solution is to shrink the scope of my experience to avoid stressful situations, uh, perhaps to develop indifference to these challenges. And all of these strategies are flawed. And if people understood the other type of stress, they would have no difficulty dealing with that and they would be able to uh, really live a far more fulfilling life. And that type of stress is what Selye referred to as eustress from the Greek good or true, as in euphoria. You feel euphoric. And whether we experience a pleasant or unpleasant result from an event depends upon how our nervous system perceives, processes, and interprets that event. Selye wrote, the endocrine glands in the nervous system help us both to adjust to the constant changes which occur in and around us and to navigate a steady course toward whatever we consider a worthwhile goal. So this side of stress, you stress, the perception that you're not being threatened, but you are facing challenges. And those challenges, rather than eliciting this cascade of negative aberrant changes in your physiology, in your posture, in your endocrine system, in your nervous system, uh, the way you metabolize and so forth, you have the opportunity to grow. You have the opportunity to expand your scope of adaptability rather than contract it. So this concept of eustress, 
um, is something that I really think people need to understand. Um, you know, life's challenges can be interpreted as threats or opportunities for growth. And we've all been through situations where a negative circumstance has turned out to be a positive one because we're able to turn that challenge into something favorable, into something that causes us growth, into something that allows us to more effectively express our humanity. So what I think your listeners might find very interesting, um, particularly since um, you talk about the Center for Epigenetic Expression, Mm -hmm. is that positive stress or eustress is an effector for gene expression. Uh, As I'm sure your listeners have heard in the past, we're not slaves to our genetics. Um, You know, in high school, uh, I remember being taught um, that your genetic legacy determined the nature of your human experience. And there was nothing you could do about it. Today, we know that it's genetic expression, turning on or off genes that determine how effectively you can respond. So if we look at this timeline, our bodies really kind of have three things going. We have the genetic legacy that we've inherited over very, very long periods of time. Mm -hmm. Uh, That stuff that's hardwired. On the other extreme, we have nervous system responses, which are designed to produce adaptation in the here and now Uh, as quickly as possible. In between the two, we have epigenetic mechanisms where the organism, in effect, is saying, hey, I can't wait for evolutionary change, and I need strategies that go beyond the immediate nervous system responses. So by turning certain genes on and other genes off, genetic expression is changed, And this can affect future generations. Uh, I remember I was at the UN uh, back when I was chair of the NGO or non-governmental organization health committee. And, you know, here we were sitting there with our our fancy credentials and so forth. And a Native American woman came to speak to us. And she said, you know, whenever one of our children is faced with a serious life decision, we ask them to consider the impact of that decision on seven generations. And it's something I had heard before, but it really resonated in my heart. And interestingly, um, you know, studies show that, yeah, that's about as long as, as they have in some instances been shown to last. Um, maybe shorter than that, um, but these epigenetic changes in expression Uh, can be passed to future generations. So when someone says, why does it matter if I uh, smoke? Why does it matter if I'm stressed out or angry or uh, have these aberrant emotional outbursts or eat poorly or drink poorly or otherwise make dubious life choices in terms of physical, chemical, and emotional experiences, it's because those epigenetic strategies are passed on to future generations. Uh, There have been recent papers published comparing Holocaust survivors to individuals uh, that are age, gender, and lifestyle matched uh, that didn't experience the Holocaust. Um, And that epigenetic impression is there, and it's very powerful, and it has the potential of compromising an individual's ability to effectively respond to environmental dynamics. So the fascinating thing about this whole eustress, distress thing is that if your nervous system is working properly, if you have the ability to perceive an environmental challenge as an opportunity to grow Mm -hmm. and expand your experience as a human being and to more effectively adapt in the future, that can actually lead to epigenetic changes that create a greater future for your offspring. 
Absolutely. And and what you wrote, which I thought was so profound, was whether we experience a pleasant or unpleasant result from an event depends upon how our nervous system perceives, processes, and interprets that event. I mean, that's, that's as my son would say, that's the sugar. That's That's it right there. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. It truly is. And, and the beautiful thing that we as human beings can do, that to the best of our knowledge, Selye's experimental animals cannot, is to transform a negative challenge into a positive opportunity by exercising the power of our rational mind and, and the human spirit that drives it. And the key to pulling that off is a nervous system that's able to respond appropriately. Absolutely. So, Chris, talk to our audience about stress and chiropractic, because most people have never heard this before. Well, again, a lot of people don't really understand what chiropractic's about. Correct. And if we go back to the historical literature, and I hate to, you know, bore you with that but to me it's fascinating in chiropractic 15 years before Selye's 1936 publication uh, two chiropractors B.J. Palmer and Craven described a similar concept which they called concussion of forces where you had external invasive forces and internal resistive forces and instead of using the term distress and eustress they talked about ease or dis-ease. Mm. And the concept of chiropractic is, is so simple and so elegant and, and just ties in beautifully with contemporary scientific thought. Um, you know, when I was considering chiropractic as a career, I asked my chiropractor, you know, what is it that chiropractors do? And his response, I think, really gets it. He said, chiropractic is based on four simple ideas. The first is that the body is a self-healing mechanism. It's an optimum-seeking mechanism. If you cut your finger, it heals. If you cut the finger of a corpse, it doesn't. It's life that heals. And he said, second, the nervous system is the master system of the body. Every dimension of the human experience is processed through the nervous system. Every thought, every feeling, every action is mediated by the nervous system. And he said, third, if there's interference with the nervous system, and in chiropractic, a common form of nervous interference is what we call vertebral subluxation, where there's a mechanical change in the position or motion of the bones of the spine that interferes with the body's ability to perceive and respond. And he said, when such interference is possible and occurs, not only can it compromise your physical well-being, but because it changes your perception of the world and limits your ability to effectively respond to the world, it can have psycho-emotional consequences as well. And when this happens to a significant number of individuals in a society, you have a sick society. Mm -hmm. And he said, fourth, what I do as a chiropractor is seek to locate and correct the cause of that interference. And I must say it gave me goosebumps then, and it still does today, because we are no longer slaves to our genetic legacy as we were taught back in the 50s and 60s, we have effective clinical strategies to expand the scope of the human experience and allow people to really not only sculpt their future, but that of humanity as well. We're able to do that in our office when we examine a new patient and we re-examine a patient because we have technology today that allows us to do so. Yeah, and it's very exciting, and, you know, I'm proud to have been involved in the development of, of a lot of that technology. Uh, we have ways to actually measure how effectively the nervous system is capable of responding uh, to changes in the environment. We can look at patterns of muscle activity in the muscles surrounding the spine. We can look at how well the body is regulating temperature. 
which looks at the portion of the nervous system that regulates the organs, glands, and blood vessels. It gives us a snapshot of that function. And we have the ability to see how effectively the nervous system and the heart are engaged in a two-way communication uh, that reflects your scope of adaptability and how well balanced your nervous system is. So these tools objectify the whole process and again really allow us to design far more effective clinical strategies than we could just a few decades ago. It is truly brilliant and it is a wonderful tool that we're able to share with with our community in in our office. So that that is wonderful. Talk to me a little bit about what the World Health Organization says about stress. Well, the World Health Organization defines health as complete physical, social, and mental well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, that makes perfect sense, but when they try to evaluate health, what are the things that uh, most policymakers and, and, and major organizations look at? They look at morbidity and mortality. Yep. They look at sickness and death rather than looking at measures of health. And that is perhaps a topic for, for another show. Sure. But um, we have the ability now, again, to uh, look at what we call salutogenic strategies. Salus uh, means health, invincibility, and well-being. And genesis, of course, means the production of, the birth of. So salutogenesis is giving birth to health. And by looking at strategies to enhance health, rather than merely preventing disease, we move from a, a world of, of fear, uh, where we seek to prevent something we think is destructive, to developing strategies to expand the scope of our experience and to truly experience complete physical, mental, and social well-being. Absolutely. Um, and getting back to Hans Selye, what did he say about health and stress? Selye said, The secret of health and happiness lies in successful adjustment to the ever-changing conditions on this globe. The penalties for failure in this great process of adaptation are disease and unhappiness. Uh, so he spoke in a very pragmatic context and these words, to me, are, are very empowering. He's speaking like a chiropractor there. <laughs> uh, so, also, I just wanted to touch on, I could not bring up a chiropractic um, conversation without bringing up Dr. Barge. And what did Dr. Barge say? Well, Dr. Barge is, is an amazing man. He was a, a lifelong mentor of mine. And he wrote a book called One Cause, One Cure. And a lot of people said, well, that's got to be ridiculous. How can you say there's only one cause of disease or illness? But think of what he said. He said, there is but one cause in disease, the body's inability to comprehend itself or its environment. And that goes to the explanation I was given by my chiropractor, as well as the work of Selye inability to comprehend itself or its environment, inability to make the qualitatively and quantitatively appropriate responses to changes in the internal and external environment, uh, which allow us to function. Wonderful. I mean, that is just brilliant. And, and he was a brilliant man way, way ahead of his time. Uh, B.J. Palmer also said in speaking about uh, chiropractic and interference talking about the year 2000 now bj passed away what year was it 1961 61 so he's talking about 40 years later what did he say well he had a vision of a world um that is very different from the world we have today his vision for the world 2000 was one where we would see a race of giants physically and mentally. People would not know what tuberculosis is except from history. 
No insane hospitals where men and women are confined as in prison and made to suffer untold abuse. There would be no more penitentiaries because no crime would be committed by a sane man or woman. No poor houses because every man would be well and happy and have full possession of his faculties. So that was his vision. And his charge to the profession was, you are to prepare the way for future generations to follow. You are to blaze the way, blast the rocks, clear all rubbish of ignorance and prejudice, and open up the grand highway of truth. I love that. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that yet. Maybe within the next 40 years, um, we, we will see that. But we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't seen that yet. But I, I, I suspect that I am seeing and living in a time where change is happening. Well, as he wrote, uh, we need to go from abnormal interpretation to normal interpretation, distortion to healthful manifestation, corruption to correction. And this all goes to, is there an accurate perception of what's going on inside and outside so that we can make the appropriate changes to achieve balance and growth. Absolutely. So I know we talked about it a, a little bit before, but just talk um, a, a little bit about positive stress and gene expression. I know we did hit on that earlier. Yeah. Um, it's very important because we're seeing that the things that interface the internal with the external env environment are the mechanisms that are involved in gene expression. Uh, you know, biochemically, we have methylation. Uh, we also have kind of mechanical stuff where uh, things coil and uncoil. Um, and all of this occurs in response to the interface between the internal and external environment uh, the cell membrane, and, and Bruce Lipton has written a lot about this, as, as I'm sure you're aware. Mm -hmm. So when we are exposed to eustress or positive stress, gene expression changes. In fact, Dean Ornish, who was vilified by some of his medical colleagues uh, when he was advocating lifestyle changes as a means of addressing dynamics of disease, um, did a, a fascinating experiment with men who were suffering with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And some of these men declined traditional medical treatment. Instead, they chose to undergo a lifestyle regimen over a controlled period of time. And Ornish published a paper showing that, you know, literally hundreds of genes were turned on and turned off as a result of this lifestyle intervention so rather than being victims of their cancer they were able to adopt a lifestyle which produced epigenetic changes which at least in theory should lead to more favorable outcomes where can people find you these days i'm a subscriber to on purpose have been doing so for the last uh, almost 20 years so where can yeah, people this find is our 22nd year wow well, this, this is a program primarily for chiropractors. If you're interested, you can go to chiroonpurpose.com and um, see what it's about. And uh, it's a great way of just keeping up with what's going on in chiropractic and creating professional growth in your life and in your practice um, by investing just three hours a month. So uh, that's available for chiropractors. And, uh, well, we have a few subscribers that are non-chiropractors. We have a couple MDs. We have a couple attorneys, believe it or not, uh, and a couple scientists. But uh, it's primarily for chiropractors. You know, it's amazing. I was just speaking to a cardiologist who was espousing the benefits of chiropractic. And I said to myself, we've come a long way um, from 1895, where we now have cardiologists that are talking about chiropractic and, and the same thing, gene expression and all the wonderful things that chiropractic has to offer. And I have, honestly, you to thank and, and Patch and Tempo 
because you guys were my my first exposure to um, vitalistic chiropractic, and we continue to live that lifestyle. And I just want to thank you. Oh, well, thank you. It's people like you who make it a reality that uh, are going to change the world. Well, everybody, thanks so much for listening. If you like the podcast, please tell your friends and family. If you would be so kind to leave a review for us on iTunes, that would be wonderful as well. Until next time, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye.